This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 327, Layout Builder versus Paragraphs. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today, we are talking about Layout Builder versus Paragraphs. Joining us in the guest host seat for the next four weeks is our friend, you may know him, Stephen Cross. Stephen's a former host of Talking Drupal, a Drupal developer with the federal government, a NEDCAMP organizer, and if you don't know it by now, a Linux advocate. Stephen, welcome back to the show and thanks for joining us. You know, it's funny. Um, well, I'm super happy to be here, but I'm actually a little nervous. It's weird after not really? being here for six months. Yeah. It's like a little Christmas gift for all of our listeners. Yeah. We're bringing, bringing Stephen back, or a holiday gift, I guess I should say. Um, we're bringing Stephen back in to uh, round out the year here. Maybe it's um, more like a trick or a treat. <laughs> he, he, I mean, I guess it depends on, on how they view it. And I'm right. sure they'll, they'll let us know. Um, they, they tend to let us know things like that. Um, if you haven't guessed already, I'm John Picozzi and joining me today, uh, Nick Laughlin, what's going on with you? Uh, not too much this week. Uh, actually, that's not true. Actually, we got something pretty exciting going on. Uh, we got some family visiting. Uh, my wife's mother and brother are visiting from Columbia. We oh, have cool. had a chance to see them in three years. Uh, so took quite a bit of planning uh, and logistics to get them here during the pandemic, but they're spending the holidays here, um, be here for the next month or so. And so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, her mom has never experienced snow. So we're also hoping for at least one good storm. Uh, Actually, before they head out. I don't know about you guys. So Nick is about an hour and a half north of me, uh, but it looks like around Christmas Eve, Christmas, there may be a, a front coming in to, that's producing snow and rain and some other stuff, at least down this way. So I'm assuming you'll probably get snow. No. Yeah, hopefully. That, that's <laughs> Steven doesn't true. seem happy about that. No, well, I'm, fl I'm, flying to, I'm flying to Arizona on Christmas Day. So I'd rather not Ooh. have that. Oh, that's all right. they're, they're good at de-icing, <laughs> de-icing the plans. And okay. once you get, once you get above the clouds, you'll be all right. Um, so family visiting interest, I would be interested to hear how their, how their travel process was. Was it as simple as like getting on the plane and just coming here? I'm assuming there was some testing involved. Uh, so to enter the country, they had to be tested, I think within 24, 72 hours, and Columbia has the same restriction going back. So ah. they'll have to be tested. And it has to be a PCR test, I believe. Um, yeah, and, everybody's pretty much requiring those, right? Yep. And then obviously masks on the plane. Um, yeah. All right. So it's not like it's pretty straightforward, actually. Yeah, it seems pretty. Yeah. I mean, it's like the new normal, obviously, but like it seems pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easy as as traveling goes. So that's good. Well, I'm glad they're yep. I'm glad they're here. And hopefully, Nick, uh, Nick, do I remember her brother spending an extended period of time here with you guys a few years back? Yeah, he came for six weeks, maybe four years ago. Oh, okay, um, cool. And so, yeah, that he so he he saw snow. Although, right, I remember that's what I was remembering. Time. Yeah, yeah. The the problem was it was so cold, even though it snowed, it was so cold that we couldn't like go sledding <laughs> or build snowmen. I mean, it was like. Every time it snowed, it was like 10 degrees and it's just, just too cold. You're like um, outside so for a court. minute and then you're like, nope, I'm all set. <laughs> yeah, it's too cold for us. So uh, if it's too cold for us, it's too cold for those from Columbia. So we're hoping for a snowstorm and, you know, a little, you know, the slightly warmer weather so we can do like the typical snowman type experience. So, but yeah, it, either way, we're, we're happy to have them here and it's good to finally see them again. Cause it's been, it's been three years. That's awesome. Uh, so Steven, uh, along with your, your traveling, you're doing some other stuff. What's going on with you? Uh, not too much. The last few weeks I've been doing significant amount of B hat work, which has been fun to do. Um, I think I've finally gotten to the point with B hat that I've got a process that's going to work with, you know, development environment and production environment and testing. And I'm excited so for, to get that stuff launching for people that might not know what is B hat. Uh, so B hat is a way of, it's a PHP tool is a way of testing 
uh, doing front end business side testing. So it's not like PHP unit tests, but it's a scripting language that you can um, do testing front ends of websites. So easily. like BHAT uses, and correct me if I'm wrong or misinformed, but BHAT mm-hmm. uses something called Gherkin, right? Mm-hmm. And that yep. goes back to like, typically goes back to like a user story. So like exactly, yeah, if yeah. the user clicks on the login button, they should get a login <laughs> modal or something yeah. like that. Yeah, in uh, in our group uh, at the ATF, which is where I'm working, uh, we have very extensive user acceptance testing that we do. Um, for every every ticket that goes out is pretty extensively user tested before it hits the production site, and those have been mostly manual over the years. And uh, a, re- a well written user acceptance test translates extremely well to a well written Gherkin hat test. So uh, the process is kind of, you know, we've got years of really well-written UAT and we're kind of moving those over to these uh, BHAT tests uh, and then splitting them up to, you know, which ones do you want to run on a regular basis on a production server to just test that the site's healthy versus what kind of tests do you want to run every time you do a merge request? And those right. tests aren't the same all the time. They usually quite different. So because you can run different tests at different points in the CI process, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Like um, and then more and early tests, on, less, less as you get closer to production in most cases. Yeah. And I've also discovered that you can cron Travis because we use Travis CI. Oh, interesting. So you can set up a cron process with them. So we have some scripts that aren't even triggered by those, uh, by, events in git they're just triggered by run once a day and i want to test these things on the server we're going to go down a rabbit hole here uh travis has has their stability gotten better i know we use i last time i used them was probably like almost a year ago now but and their stability was pretty awful has it gotten better yeah significantly better like a year and a half ago we would have things that um took forever to run we're sitting in queues we're erroring out um, Mm -hmm. but it seems like seems like I've had no problems with them in, in a year or so. They've been running really well for us. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember using it. It was it, it worked really well when it worked, but then they yeah. their development team kind of shifted. They got bought and like there was some, I don't know, corporate stuff going on. But yeah. anyway, glad to hear that that's going well. Um, for me this week, uh, I am winding down. I'm getting excited to take some time off around the holidays. Um, as you may or may not be able to hear, uh, my kids are already on uh, Christmas vacation. So, um, having them, having them here while, while trying to work is, um, is, is, is interesting. Um, but, uh, looking forward to the holidays, looking forward to time off and, um, with Nick, uh, same, same sort of scenario as Nick, haven't seen some of my family in a long time, like a year plus. Um, so looking forward to getting together with them over the holidays and, uh, and uh, reconnect. Hi, this is Mike Hersha with Florida Drupal Camp, and holy cow, the Florida Drupal Camp site just launched. With me, I have Adam. Hey, Adam. Hello. Adam Barn and Amy June Highline, the Aaron Winborn Award winner. How's it going? Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Adam, what are the dates for Florida Drupal Camp? It is February 18th through the 20th, 2022, in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Ooh, do you know what the average temperature is in Orlando that time of year? I believe it's about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. You are correct. Amy June, can you give us an overview of how many days this conference is? It is a three-day conference. Friday is trainings, half and full day. Uh, Saturday is a full day of sessions, and Sunday is sessions and contributions. We have a brand new website, Rockin' Drupal 9, brand new theme. It's at fldrupal.camp, and everyone who's listening is invited to this. And uh, hey, Adam, are, are we going to have an alligator at the camp, like for real? We are. We're going to have an actual alligator that you can pet and see and get your picture taken <laughs> with, and, and he probably will not bite you, probably. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a maybe. But, but we're seriously going to have an alligator at the camp. And uh, so check out the camp. Session submissions are open. Uh, Sponsorships are open. Uh, We have uh, two of our three featured speakers announced. And yeah, so fldrupal.camp, February 18th through 20th, 2022 in beautiful Orlando, Florida. And we're in person. Holy cow. I know, right? All right. Thanks, everybody. So...
So let's move into our module of the week. And uh, Stephen, you're going to tell us about this module. Yeah. So the module of the week is Link It. That's L I N K I T. Um, the Link It description on the module pa page describes it as this Link It provides an easy interface for internal and external linking within a WYSIWYG editor by using autocomplete field. Linkit has default support for nodes, users, taxonomies, files, comments, and basic support for all entities. Um, what I do like about what the description is for this page, and I love it when modules do this, is this page describes what are the key advantages of this module. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you see a description, but you don't quite get it. And um, they, yeah. they summarize it as the user does not have to copy or remember URLs. Number two, it's a, a sustainable solution for internal linking, and it has a friendly UI. So those are like, it's the mission of the module. Um, so basically, it takes the default uh, link, linking capability in CK Editor and supercharges it. So basically, once you configure it, you can, when you go to add a link to a piece of text, you can type in start to type in this autocomplete, like the name of a article title or some, or user's name um, or the beginning of a comment or a taxonomy. And it will, it will pop you up with a list of um, possible uh, pieces of content that you want to link to. And then you select one and then it puts the link into the WYSIWYG editor. So it's super handy like that. And, and it's, it's only used with CK editor WYSIWYG. Well, well, you know, it's interesting right. because the feature list, and they also have a, an extensive feature list on the module page. It does list that it works with, uh, what's the other one? C, IMC? IMC. IMC. -E. I think it says that on the page. I'm gonna, I should have had the page. Are people I, I, still, I the, not to, not the to go way. down, like are people still using IMC? I don't know. Of course. Of course. Not many, but... As far as I know, but okay. of course. Let me just look here. Let me pull the page up. I should add it. Does it? Sorry, you, you yeah, may have ahead. you may have said this. I missed it. Does it work with like a regular link field? Like if you were to put a link field on a content type, could or is it simply like in the CK editor interface? It's for the WYSIWYG. Yeah, it's for the, the WYSIWYG, WYSIWYG specific. Got yep. it. Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. So currently. Um, Linkit has, so Linkit's been around for a while. So it has versions going back to version six and seven. Mm -hmm. I think it was first put out in 2011. So it's been around for quite a while. Um, there's currently two versions that work with Drupal eight and nine. Um, they've got this thing going on right now where they have a eight X version, version five that's in beta. And then they have a version six that's not, the version number is not tied to Drupal 8. And those two versions are exactly the same code. Um, so it's it's like they're in a transition period to get rid of the 8x at the beginning of the version number. Um, there's also a 8x4, which is the current release. It's not beta, but it's only in maintenance mode only. So that will be going away soon. So if you're going to install this, I would suggest going for the 6 version, I think would be the the version marked as six would be the smart thing to do at this point. Um, there's also a Drupal seven version that's still maintained. Um, and it's actually used quite a bit. There's like 11,000 installs in the Drupal seven. And then all of the Drupal eight versions, if you add the usage up for those, so the eight, four, the eight, five, and the six, those are like 47,000 installs. So this is a pretty heavily used module. Yep. I, um, I just want to mention yeah. um, the 8.4 is no longer available because they deprecated Drupal 8 module, oh, Drupal 8 only module. So if you go to the project page now, there's no 8.4. Um, and I think they just ran that process yesterday. So oh, okay. Why. Interesting. I didn't see that. I, I saw something in the infrastructure channel talking about running that process, but yeah, they, they for it must have been Drupal 8 only version because it's it's no longer on the page. So the module's super easy to use. It's kind of like a install it and enable it thing. It doesn't require any um, 
any other modules. And basically the way this works is um, you define a profile for a link it. You can have multiple profiles. And when you define a link it profile, you can add what they call matchers to it. It's basically the functionality that you want to add to that profile. So you can say for this profile, I'm interested in the user being able to link to content and files. And then you might create another profile that you want someone to have access to users and taxonomy. So you define these inside these matchers. What's really handy about this module is the presentation to the end user, because you can define when you define one of these matchers or the functionality you want. Like when you say, I want people to access content, you can pick what bund bundle types you want, and then you can define how it's displayed to them. So like if you want to display articles to someone, you could say when they, when they search it and they see it come up in a pop-up list in the autocomplete, you would like them to see the title, then see the author, and then see the create date. So you can give them the information okay. that they need to make the selection to choose the right content to link to. Um, and it's using like tokens. So I don't know why the token module isn't required as now that I'm thinking about this. Um, cause it doesn't say the token modules required and I don't think I installed it either, but it's, it's like using the Drupal tokens. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great presentation. It's really easy to configure and they structure it in a way in Drupal nine that you can build your own plugins to extend the matchers for your own type of matchers. If you want to have them, um, I actually haven't used the module yet. So what, what made me think of this module is I've been researching uh, ways to link in WYSIWYG editors for Drupal 9 project. And I was, I've been evaluating this, haven't actually stuck it on a production site yet, but did spend some time looking at it. So I, I'm curious if you guys have any experience with this module, or have any thoughts about it. So uh, I, <laughs> I've maybe used it once a while back, not, not like it was installed on a site that I was, I was, Either either uh, auditing or or using, um, so I, I came in contact with it and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, I have not gone like installed it a lot on projects, um, and you know from what I hear, it's kind of like some people love it and other people just absolutely despise it and will never install it. Um, I, I wonder so, why that is. Yeah. Do you do you have any sense of why someone would hate it or despise uh, it? <laughs> No, I don't. I don't. I mean, from based upon what you said, it sounds like it's pretty useful. It sounds like it's, it's, it's a helpful, um, you know, UI improvement for, for admins who might be trying to, might be trying to find things. So I don't really know, but I've, um, I've, I've had conversations with people where you're like, oh, well there's link it. And they're like, oh no, don't use that. Yeah. It's fairly, it's fairly polarizing. I, I think one of the things is it kind of I mean, it, this isn't a great analogy, but it's kind of like media for links where it's like an extra library on top. It, it's a fair amount to, and, and I think that causes some problems for some it's people. It's not a great, it's I, not a great analogy because I would never build a Drupal site without media. I, I just meant in that it's like a wrapper around something that can be built in another way. So some people hmm. prefer just the simplicity of like the built-in, but I, I only had extensive experience with it once and it did introduce some significant hurdles. Um, and that was a Drupal 6 site that was migrating to Drupal 7 hmm. and migrating the Linkit output tokens was extraordinarily painful. Hmm. Um, one of the more painful Drupal experiences I had. Now, it's been six or seven years, so I don't remember all the details. I think that it was because they were also using Linkit to handle legacy URLs. So I think it was one of those sites, it was a site that had been around forever and they had like the old, old version of the site. You know how some sites will sometimes like have a link to like a completely different domain that doesn't even exist anymore. And Linkit was hard coding those and then just using some random, some, some weird plugin to like know what to do with it when it saw it. Um, so I don't even think that the migration issues were directly related to Linkit, mm. but they were all Linkit 
assets. I don't know if you call them assets, but they're all all link at artifacts mm -hmm. that we were trying to migrate. Well, I, I think the same. Experience. I think it works the same way now because when you install this, uh, you go into after you define the profile for link it the profiles you want. You then go into text formatting. And you enable for like uh, basic HTML, you go in and turn link it on. And then you also turn on the formatter <laughs> for it. So it's yeah. doing it's doing the similar thing where it's dropping some sort of token in the actual data. And then when you display the content, right. it's parsing it. So uh, so it brings up it brings up to me, I wonder like how does like translation handle? Is it like link it friendly? Um, I wonder mm -hmm. how that works too. Yeah, like, I, don't, I, I think after that project, I went to install on, on another project maybe a year or two after and evaluated it and decided against it again. And I, I, again, I, it's been long enough that I don't remember the exact whys. It, it was just, I think it behaved and there was like a behavior that it just didn't quite work. And rather than trying to figure it out, mm. I just decided to go with kind of the core default linking process in CK Editor. Steven, are you building a POC for this or you, you just, you said you're evaluating it. How deep is that evaluation going? What's a POC? Uh, proof of concept. Oh, um, I thought it was point of contact. Um, it could be that too. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're, um, we're not doing an extensive evaluation on it, but I'm evaluating it like to see hmm. there's not a lot of choices out there for things like this. Right. So, um, some of the check marks for us are translation. That's one. Um, it's post migration. So uh, this is on a new site and a new way mm -hmm. to link after we've migrated from um, Drupal 7 to Drupal 9. So that's a consideration too, is sure. what happens when I turn this on after I've embedded links already. Um, mm -hmm. So don't know what that looks like. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at right now. But, you know, at this point, I was just kind of getting a feel for what it does. Mm -hmm. And it looks like something that's valuable for our content administrators. Yeah, I guess my two thoughts on that one is like testing the translation aspect of it too, to see how it how that yeah. is handled. And then the other is finding out if there is a way to add it to the link field, because I feel like if you had a piece of content with a link field on it, right, it may be annoying to admins to say like, Hey, I have this really cool functionality within a WYSIWYG, but now a right. general link field doesn't have that functionality. Right. And, and it's like annoying, you know, if, if it does that, if it, if there's maybe another module that adds this for you, I'm not aware of it. There is mm -hmm. one module that I found related to this uh, is link it media library. Mm -hmm. So they did note on the module that it does the, the current version of it, the 8.5 and 6.0 version does not support media entity anymore, that you have to use core media in the module moving forward, which conceptually makes sense to me. And then so there's this additional library called link it media library, that when you pull up the, the link, when you pull up a link, it adds a button to pick from your media library. I haven't played with that yet, um, but it's something that I'll take a look at as well. Interesting. Cool. Well, that was uh, sounds like a great module. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing more as you do more do more research on it. Let's jump into our primary topic, and uh, this episode is titled "Layout Builder versus Paragraphs." So we're gonna cordially jump into the layout builder versus paragraphs debate and um, you know try to point out the pros and cons to each and what you should kind of think about when um, trying to make the decision between one or the other or or maybe even both. Um, so let's start off with a uh, layout builder. You know, why, why choose layout builder? Um, you know, some of my, uh, feelings on this are it's in core, right? So like, I, I tend to like to try to stay as close to core as humanly possible when, when building sites, obviously there's a super robust, um, module ecosystem with Drupal and obviously it adds a lot of great functionality, but if I can get, get something that is in core that, that kind of, um, checks, checks a box. I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it. 
Um, and then, you know, I think, you know, from there for me, it's a, it's a better UI, um, for admins who are editing content, um, over paragraphs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about paragraphs, UI options in a minute, anything else that yeah, comes I, to mind when you're thinking about choosing layout builder. I, I would just jump in briefly with the better UI and just comment to say that it's better a UI if you make adjustments to it. Uh, in my experience, just the out of the box layout builder has just a few things that are slightly confusing, uh, for end users. For example, one of them is one of the big ones is because layout builder uses blocks, the layout builder interface requires you to add a block title for every single block. Even if the block is something like a text block where like, you're not showing the title, it's literally just a mm -hmm. block of a WYSIWYG field. Uh, so without making some changes, that title field is always going to show up and be required. And the first question anybody is looking at layout builder is always, why do I have to enter this title if it's not used? Well, that's uh, the administrative. It, it becomes the administrative title in that in that regard, right? Well, or it could just be something that's optional and doesn't show up. I mean, pretty much every time I implement layout builder, I have some code that just makes it not required or auto or hides it and auto fills it with a UUID uh, because if you're if you're creating a layout that has 20 blocks on it having to create 20 administrative titles is just a lot more effort than most content editors want to go nick, nick do you use a module for that or do you have like custom code that you uh well custom code feature? in a module i actually based most of my suggestions nate denzel uh gave a talk at the last in-person ned camp uh where he talked about layout builder and some of the modifications he made uh, that was one of the suggestions he made. There were four or five or six of them. And I've implemented most of those uh, on most projects. You know, it's things like making the tray a little bit wider, um, filtering the layouts a little bit better. Uh, you know, it, there's just a fair amount. Uh, it's not a significant amount. It's one of those ones where once you have that module, you kind of can just move it over to the next one. But it's there, there's a decent amount of customization that I, I find you need to do in order to make it work. So I guess, I guess that that is accurate. There are some customizations that you need to make to make it, it make it more user friendly. Um, but as far as like core admin UI interface, right? Like layout builder is definitely better than than paragraphs, right? It, it, because like it's built, it's built into core, but it's also easier to place blocks and and the nesting of the items is is a little bit easier, right? Um, and that uh, you know the the ability to use layouts kind of out of the box with core makes makes it a little, in my opinion, makes it easier easier to use, right? Yeah, I think I think the primary thing that's more useful is the drag and drop functionality mm -hmm. and the, kind of like the UI for creating creating the actual layout. So um, one of the differences between creating a layout with paragraphs versus creating a layout with layout builder is the layout builder, you can add a section and say, I want this to be two column, you can drag stuff between them. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the paragraph, you're you're entering something like two column paragraph and then just entering sequentially and they just have to know the first section is on the left and the second section is on the right or vice versa yep. or, or whatever whatever the rule set is or your nesting um, paragraphs and, where one is a two column yep. layout and then you're putting yep. paragraphs in exactly. between right yeah um and so so when it comes to showing visually you know layout builder does definitely show that a little bit better um that's for sure and, and that's something to really consider and I think that that kind of leads us into our next point here, which is performance concerns, right? Paragraphs can become unperformant um, uh, as it gets larger and as you nest more paragraphs. Like typically nesting paragraphs isn't the best idea. Um, sometimes it's a necessity, but it's not, it's not great. And going with Layout Builder alleviates those performance concerns that you may get with paragraphs. <sighs> Uh, yes and no. This is one of those things where I think it can become an issue. But if you have content complex enough where it's that nested, like you can, there's usually other issues that you run into anyway. Like, for example, I have some pages, like there's sometimes on sites you have to spend some attention and time on figuring out how to make something more performant. 
but it's never, it's never been a deal breaker. Uh, you know, there's, there's ways to lazy load things. If the page is too long, there's ways to cache it. Uh, it really depends, I guess, if you're, you know, how well, you, if you can cache it anonymously, for example, because once it's cached, it's built and it will load just as fast as any other complex content. Uh, so the performance one is, is something to think about, but it's not something that I've personally run into as a blocker for paragraphs. Yeah. So it's something that I've, I've heard of, um, quite a bit and, uh, I'm actually going to drop in a, uh, I was just going to, I was going to go there, John. And I wanted to, I wanted to preface that question on that. You just added into that document. So I'm coming at this topic today from perspective of I've used paragraphs a lot. I'm doing some layout builder work now, and I'm making some decisions about the, the right way to structure the content moving forward. And I think it is leading into this next question. And one of the problems that I've, I have with paragraphs and with layout builder in general is we kind of live in this world today where our data and a lot of us, a lot of our systems needs to interface with other systems. So like if I'm going to store data in my system, I need to make it available through an API. Like I got to think of that kind of thing, right? When you're data modeling and it feels like to me with either of these approaches that when you come at, data structuring from the UI side, you lose out on storing that data in a way that it's easy to use outside of your system later. So like if I store data, com and you were using this word, Nick, complex data, right? Yeah. If I'm storing complex data relationships in these things called paragraphs or layout builder blocks, is that data really accessible in other parts of the system to make it available to an API or views and things like that. Don't you, doesn't this destroy like the pure data model of data sitting by itself? So I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that. I would say okay, that, that's why I'm asking. Uh, yeah. I, I would say paragraphs does it less than layout builder breaks that model less than um, layout builder. Yeah, if you're if you have nested paragraphs, building a view that cleanly outputs all the data, like without just with, and and not the paragraph ID, for example, that's a little complex. But you know, with paragraphs, if I'm building an API, many times I'll just write an entity field query that loads that stuff as it needs to, and just outputs it. Like I, I just I just wrote that for a client right now. It, we're using paragraphs as module content blocks that outputs images and text. And then there's an API that just returns those as JSON. And I'm just using entity field queries in a controller route to, to flatten the flatten the data appropriately. Um, and it with layout builder, because everything gets stored serialized in the database, it's I haven't, I'm sure there's a way to get that data. Mm -hmm. um, but the one time I tried to get to that data, it looked like it was significantly more complex, like because it's serialized, so you can't. It's, right. it's just like a, a blob in the database. Yeah, right. Like you, right. Um, it, you know, it's pure content at that point when it's stored. Uh, and even if it wasn't serialized, it's still blocks, which are entities, which is the same thing as paragraphs, right? So it's still, you know, discrete content. So you're not, you're not, you're not gaining any advantages in layout builder. There's only an additional barrier when it comes to exposing that data to an API. So, so is it you. is it you're sacrificing? You sacrifice the pure like storage of relational data and the data model for easeability or usability to build pages. And is that what's happening? Yeah. Absolutely, in my experience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that yeah. uh, further down when we start talking okay. about the, the cons, I guess. But yeah, maybe we kind of um, get into cons a little bit. Yeah. So Josh's question, Josh Miller um, asked this, and I, I guess this is the exact point that we were just talking about. You wrote, what about the all important content model? Question mark. It says layout builder puts content in fieldable blocks, paragraphs, puts content in fieldable entities. Neither is easy to put that content in a table. 
So it's not really a question he writes, but more of a concern. And I guess that's the same one I have. But when you come right. down to, when you come down to, if you want to keep your data model pure, what, what are easy ways to make the user interface for users in Drupal? Like if you created yeah. entity models uh, with relationships that you could easily build views and queries on in Drupal, how can you make that an easy interface to work with? So I think if you look at it at a content model like level, right? You, you, you have two paths you can go down, right? The layout builder path, which is essentially like referencing blocks from your content type, right? So the content type itself or the entity itself doesn't store the content. The block is storing the content and then referencing that, that block, right? Um, which to be fair, allows that content to be reusable on another entity if need be. So if you have a, a piece of content that you are going to use on a couple of different pages, a call to action or something like that, putting it in a block makes a little bit more, more sense for reus reusability. Um, or you have the paragraphs approach, which is essentially adding additional fields to that entity. And that entity ha is, has that content within it, right? So you call the entity. Yep. Um, you know, I think if you're looking at it from like an API approach, and I haven't necessarily done this, so this is kind of like hypothetical, you're looking at like, okay, I need this page. So now I call the page. Now I need to go call, get all the blocks that compose that page, right? And then figure out a way to, to get to that content, as opposed to like, I call the page, there's all the content. Granted, it might be nested in some like really gross sort of way. Um, so I think you have to like build in, you know, obviously a layer of, of, of cleanup or organization there. But I think it comes down to, um, Stephen, to your point, where the data needs to live. Does it need to be very tightly coupled to that entity? Or is it something where it could be more loosely coupled to the entity and then reused on a couple of different entities? Um, I think that's kind of the value that you see with Layout Builder um, as well. Um, you know, again, going back to the pros here, easy UI, you have that reusability in a block to be able to say, oh, I need this block or, um, you know, I want to reuse this block from this other page that I created and, and drop it into to your, to your layout. Yeah, I, I have to say, I think Layout Builder is the module that we talked about the most before we used it. Um, <laughs> right. I think it holds the record. And I just want to say one of the things that really stands out to me now is the, my early initial impressions of Layout Builder versus actually having used it on some complex sites. As we got closer to Layout Builder coming out, I, I got personally got more and more excited. It was like one of those things that like, once it finally comes out, like why would you ever use paragraphs again? Or why would you ever use anything like that again? Just use Layout Builder. Like it, it's the cleanest way. Um, and I can say that after having, um, after having built a really complex site that uses Layout Builder, that opinion had completely changed. Like. I now, like, it's the reverse of that. I have to be convinced to use Layout Builder on a particular project in order to use it rather than using it as default. And in fact, the complex site <laughs> that uses Layout Builder actually has paragraphs and uses them fairly extensively for, for a different purpose. Uh, and, and we can get into some of the reasons why that opinion happened when we get to why not to use Layout Builder. But one of the big things I wanted to say is like, I've used it on a really complex site and my, my impression basically became like, it, you really need to have a specific use case that makes sense to use it rather than just kind of defaulting to it. And, and the reason is that the biggest, you know, spoiler, the biggest reason is because it basically breaks the default Drupal content model that you're used to. Like it breaks the yeah. connection of data to yeah. the entity. Yeah. Uh, and so things like views just don't work quite right translations you have to make there's some decisions you have to make upfront about translations when you're using layout builder um there there's a lot of uh well should we just dive into the cons right now because we well no i'd like to talk should... i'd like to talk yeah. about the why why we're going to choose oh, paragraphs, paragraphs yeah. first yeah. but okay yeah so 
so yeah, there, there, there's a lot to think about when it comes to that builder. But yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about paragraphs. Uh, what are some of the reasons? Can I make one more would... point? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Back, back, yeah, yeah. So back, Nick, you were saying you have a new impression of after building a very complex site with layout builder, you now would think that you have to be convinced to use layout builder. But I, but I would ask the question. Is that because you did it with a complex site? Like, like say you had a regular site that wasn't super complex, maybe Layout Builder would have been an easier implementation. Or you see my well, point? That, that, that's it, ki- that no, that that's kind of the use case that I have. Like, if you have okay. a site that needs to use that, like in general, I would consider Layout Builder should be relegated to content like a blog that marketers will use and doesn't need to be shared with other systems. I don't agree with that at all. Um, I don't agree. I don't agree with that point. Okay. Why? Uh, Because I think, I think Nick's right in the fact that you have to think about the type of site that you're building. Right. And if you are building a headless site where Drupal is simply a data store, right. Where, where, users aren't going in to create pages or create uh, a, a tightly coupled front end experience, then, you know, I, I think, you know, I think that you can, you can more tightly couple things to, to the, to the specific entity. Right. Um, I think that a lot of sites are moving more to a composable component based structure and system. So, I think that to say that like layout builder should only be used on like blog sites is not necessarily accurate to the way that the industry is moving. Right. So a lot of, a lot of organizations are using component libraries and component libraries map um, directly to either paragraphs or layout builder. And then those systems are used to build composable pages within Drupal. Right. So there's a whole idea of a composable architecture. Um, and those sites could be, they could be marketing sites. They could be e-commerce sites. They could really be a, a large variety of sites. Um, but I think it, it, it does, you do have to look at what the, the, the goal is for the site is the goal to make an admin's experience in composing pages easier. Is it to, you know, expose an API to a front end that doesn't really care what the, the, or needs a very structured back end to pull from. Um, and I think in some instances it could be both. So I, I do think that there are a lot of different use cases and the use case has to be taken into account when you're looking at making a decision like this. Yeah. But, but one of the things too, to, that you have to consider it doesn't even have to be like just an API and sharing the data externally. That has to be one of those things to consider. If you're trying to interact with Layout Builder programmatically whatsoever, you need to patch core. Like there's just some basic, like for example, like there's no event subscriber that lets you know when something happens within a particular section. So for mm. a, a particular section of a layout builder, there just isn't. So you have to patch core in order to, to do that. Um, and I remember when I was just trying to do like basic things that I would do with content that would take just an entity query and a, and a hook maybe, I would have to find a bunch of core patches to install. And eventually the core patches just, I couldn't have them together because they all conflicted with each other. We, there were some we literally... Very, very, there's just, we literally should have started with the why wouldn't we choose layout builder section because we're we keep going there even yeah, though yeah, yeah. even I'm though can't control then, ourselves <laughs> like you, you yeah. guys you guys um, but there's, there's something to keep in mind here too right this is not an all or nothing situation yeah. is when you say I'm using layout builder it doesn't mean you have to use it for every single page on every on the entire site right you can have a section of your site that is the pages that you know the user needs to easily customize versus it needs to apply to every single page and they need to be able to move blocks on every single page, right? Like the last section of the agenda where it says both. Do you need to choose? (laughs) (laughs) Right. 
So getting back on getting back on 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 track here, or at least a, a little more focused. And I promise, listeners, we will talk about all of this. Is this um, my fault? Uh, no, no. I think okay, it's right. Nick's Nick's disdain for okay, layout builder. Right. That's the, I didn't that's know if it was uh, if it was me being back on the show, which was causing these kinds of problems. No, 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 abs- no. absolutely. I think, I think it's because, yeah, I think it's because I'm a lot more hesitant on layout builder. When we put this topic out here, we knew that this was going to happen. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about why we would choose paragraphs, right? And, and I and I vote no editing on the show. That's what I vote. Hey, listen, I'm not the one doing the editing. So you, you do what you want. Um, so I think for me, like why, why choose layout build, uh, sorry, why choose paragraphs is like, I think for a lot of people, it's like a known entity, right? Like they put paragraphs on a site, they know what to expect. They don't have to, to, to jump over some of the hurdles that we've already talked about with layout builder. Mm. And, you know, it, it provides, again, it provides structured content on an entity, right? So it's like, it's a known, it's, I'm using entity a lot here. It's a known entity that you have the ability, like you have the ability to place structured content on your entity and then use it how, however you need to, whether it's on a front end or, or via API. Um, are there other things that you think go into like the factor of like layout builder or uh, sorry, paragraphs and why somebody would want to use that? Yeah, I mean, I think, there's a few big ones, but one of them is it's battle tested. It's been used for years. Uh, there's a lot of documentation around it. You know, if you have questions on how to do something, you can almost always find something. It's really well supported with things like Twig, uh, which are now mainstays. So it's very easy to again figure out how to get to something and output it in your template if you need to. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got a real, you know, there's a there's some certainly some quirks with things like translation, but again. It's used so much that all those, almost all those quirks are, are well documented at this point. Um, and I think one of the things too is it's very, very quick uh, to put something together. So for example, um, the project I was talking about that uses Layout Builder also uses paragraphs. I needed the ability to I think I've talked about this on the show before, but I needed the ability to store some information that a user would input, but it wasn't like a page or a block or content. Like they were storing, for example, a food log. So they would just type in like today for lunch, I had three apples. And so I just basically needed a form and needed something to store that so I could reference it. And so paragraph was a very easy way to just say, okay, this has three fields. These are the options. And I actually placed that form in a layout so that the user can access it. And then the paragraph I don't is disagree. tied to content. Is, is tied I don't disagree user. with that at all. Like I, I think, you know, my, one yeah. of my, one of my big, uh, one of my, one of my sayings as, as it goes is like paragraphs is the new field collections, right? Like that's a great use where, where, few, where you used to use field collections in Drupal six, um, like paragraphs is, is a great use for that. And, and that example illustrates it perfectly. Right. So you needed to, you know, collect a, a, a grouping of data from a user and like paragraphs is still really good at that. Do you guys remember we did a show, uh, back in May of 2020, uh, 2020 called, Oh yes. That show. Hello parts department. And in that show, uh, we basically compared using paragraphs versus uh, just plain old entities and using like enti- inline entity form to compare, you know, the difference between it. And you get a much purer data model if you just use entities versus the paragraphs. I don't know if you guys remember the show. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do. So I think, I think that's still, I think that's still true, but I think right. what paragraphs is trying to, trying to add is that component-based composable content type, right? So this is what I was, I was maybe doing a poor uh, job articulating prior is that you have to look at what the data, the, the content model is. You have to look at the data that you need to support and you have to look at how somebody's gonna use the system, right? If somebody's just going in and entering content or entering data, 
and it, and it can be a flat content type with maybe a couple of paragraphs for, for like those kind of like grouped items that you may need, then I think that's, that's great. But I think when you, when you go in, get into a content management system where a marketing team or, or somebody needs to be able to compose a front end of any sort for that content, I think it changes the dynamic quite a bit. So there are a bunch of uh, add-on modules, right? So for paragraphs, I, there are a bunch of add-on modules for Layout Builder too, but we we're talking about why we would choose paragraphs right now. And I think one of the one of the things that comes to mind, and this was this was actually brought up to me um, over the last couple of weeks um, a few, in a few different places, but one, there are a few add-on modules for paragraphs that make make things a lot easier um, uh, from the admin UI perspective. And uh, our friend Joe Crespo from At and Design uh, brought up layout paragraphs, which essentially allows paragraphs to, or the user interface for paragraphs to be more like Layout Builder and allow you to kind of drag and drop paragraphs in a in a Layout Builder esque sort of way. I think it even goes as far to add um, layout capabilities or layout templating to, mm -hmm. um, two paragraphs. So that's like one of the major disconnects is like, uh, layout builder out of the box has the ability to create layouts. So like, as Nick was saying, like one column, two column, three column, um, paragraphs, you have to kind of nest paragraphs, but I think this module, um, alleviate some of that and add some admin UI, um, improvements that allow you to be able to, uh, use paragraphs and more of a layout layout builder fashion. So you shouldn't um, be confused that the name of this module means layout builder paragraphs. I think, well, so it's layout paragraphs, which I, yeah, right. I guess, it, you know, if you, in your head, if you're like, Hey, it's the best of layout builder and the best of paragraphs put together. Um, I, yeah, I think that would be a fair, a fair, uh, uh conclusion. So since we haven't talked about any reasons why you wouldn't use Layout Builder yet, maybe we can do that now. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Nick, you have some ideas here on why you would not use Layout Builder. What are like, yeah, like, like let's come up with like, not the, let's start with not like the little nitpicky things that bother you about Layout Builder, yep. but let's let the things that would say, this is a game stopper, you show stopper, can't use it because of this yep what are they yeah there's, there's kind of three big ones that jump out to me immediately yep. one is when it comes to translations you have to make a decision pretty much up front how you want those translations to work and i don't remember all the nuance to it but basically you have to choose if your translation is going to be symmetrical or asymmetrical uh and can you go into a little more detail there what do you mean by symmetrical or asymmetrical yeah, I think symmetrical mean my, my again, it's been about a year since I had to look into this, but my memory is that symmetrical is it will essentially the layout will have to be exactly the same on all translations and asymmetrical means that you're basically building the second translation yourself manually and it can have a different layout. And there there are some other reasons why you would choose one way or the other. Right. I don't recall off the top so of the, the, they the are, issue, but, it, but it's one of those things they're incompatible with each other. You can only use one or the other. So the issue there is that layout, a layout is basically, um, say for lack of a better word, static for an entity. Right. And that's static between translations. So if you have one, no. two, th no, that you have to choose a, basically up front, whether it is or not. But right, but if you if you chose not if it, if you chose not, wouldn't you have to then duplicate uh, layouts yes. or duplicate entities for certain translations? You would basically have to rebuild the page in the new language. I, I think if I remember correctly, asymmetrical basically you can have a slightly different translation uh, layout, but you're basically building each page independently in each language. But it's still it's still a translated node. Which kicks you right that. back to right back to Drupal seven and and the way that basically like node node translation in in Drupal seven right maybe it's versus entity translation that too, yeah but 
yeah but 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 anyway it's 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 not using the translation system basically the same way that everything else in Drupal 8 does like of course of course there's pain points around translation in Drupal 8 but Drupal 8 was a massive improvement over Drupal 7 and when you're using layout builder there's just some additional consideration with translations you have to make and if and there's pros and cons to both methods but it's one of those ones where you can't have both you you kind of have to just know what those pros and cons are and make a decision and and move forward with it i suspect uh, this is because of serialized data storage right i th i think that's part of it i don't think that's okay. the whole okay um the whole of it the second big thing for me is that it splits content into two places and what i mean by that is you have like the title like when you create a node you have to create the title and maybe one or two other fields like taxonomies mm -hmm. and then you have to go to a, a save it and then you go to the layout section and build the content out and it's just an additional hurdle that you have to teach your customer editor like this section is for this stuff this section is for this other stuff and the things that could be consistent between the two aren't so when you're on the, the node edit page, the save button is at the bottom. When you're on the layout page, the save layout button is at the top. And there's just some little quirks like that that are like, okay, why couldn't you at least put the save button in the same place? It's not curiosity. Do you think something like the gin admin theme with, with its improvements to layout builder alleviates that? Cause I mean, that's really just a theme issue, right? It's not like a, it's not anything other than that. Well, where, where the button is, yeah, of course. I mean, you could move that if you wanted to. And it, I haven't used Gin Admin theme with Layout Builder, so I, I can't comment on that. Okay. Um, but just but just that paradigm of splitting it up sometimes can be a little bit painful. Um, and then the third thing is kind of the big one that I've been talking about. When you need to interact with sections or layouts or blocks interactively, whether for an API or just for functionality in the site, it requires some pretty, pretty big core patches. And those core patches many times are incompatible with each other. Um, like for example, I, I remember there were a couple of patches that I looked into and I needed both of them. And we ended up changing the feature because when I looked at modifying the patches to be compatible, like it was so deep into, into the Drupal core that I just, I couldn't even follow the patch. But like many times you can look at a patch and be like, okay, I understand what it's doing and I can replicate this or, or merge these two patches. It was so deep into the core of Drupal that I, I honestly had no idea what was going on. Um, and we, we just changed the feature so that we only needed one of the patches um, rather than modify it because it, it was just, like I said, things that you just kind of expect in Drupal just don't exist. Like the ability to know, I think at the at one of the things at the top of the list was a node doesn't know or a block doesn't know which section it's in. Uh, or like like there's there's no like two way knowledge of a block layout and content. Like they don't know what they're associated with because I think it's because it's serialized on the layout that pulls it in. So you can't be like, I'm a block in this layout. When this block changes, do this thing. Like things like that just don't exist without. Um, so it's not, it's not like a, a, like simplified. It's not thinking of it like an entity reference, right? Where it's like, Hey, this entity yeah, references, not, references block, no, you know, 521 or whatever, whatever the ID of it is. I, I think the particular thing I was trying to do is I, I had some code that added a button to a section and it would reveal the next section when it was clicked. And you could connect that you know, I could connect that button up all I wanted, but there was no way for the button to know. There's no way for me to say like, what's the next section on this content, even though it's displayed in the right order. There's no way for a particular section to be like, I am the third section on this page or the fourth section on this page or the sixth section, like there just wasn't. So I think we ended up solving it by outputting IDs on each section. 
So wouldn't that be a, using JavaScript to, to would, wouldn't that be like a layout? Oh, I'm not trying a solution here, but wouldn't that be like a looking at the layout as opposed to the the entity itself? And I mean, either way, like the layouts yeah. don't know what, like they they just didn't know what they were or what order they were in. Like there was just no way to get that information. Okay, so maybe there's yeah. now because this was about a year. This was about so, a year ago, but um. So, there were just so can, a lot of can, things like that that you just know you can interact with and you, you just couldn't, sorry. So to get like maybe back to the high level, like what are the three, four things that you would say, Nick? Let's just, can we summarize them again here? I think we got a little deep just a second there. So it's, it was. Translation. Translation issues. Translation. So splitting see. content in two places. Yep. And then the need of the need of uh, Apaches to support API. Or to support but, lots but of stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like like basically the core Drupal interaction with content that you expect programmatically doesn't many work. times doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking at this patch here for the JSON API, and it's still not clear. It looks like it's open four years ago. It's still not clear using in the last 30 days if you can do this easily. So I think you can yeah. you can apply the patches, right? As Nick said, like there are patches, you can apply them. Sometimes they kind of like fight with one another. Right. Um, but you know, I I don't know. I, I think that that all of the reasons Nick Nick stated are are valid, and they you have to take them into consideration. But I don't know if they're like hardcore, or at least for me, I don't know if they're hardcore showstoppers due to like the benefits, right? I think the splitting content thing is you're right. I think it, it you know, it, you have no, you know, entity content and then block content, right? But there's, you know, pros and cons with with everything as we're trying to illustrate here. So like reusability of content is a big one, right? Splitting that content makes sense if there's content that needs to be reused frequently. Um, translations, translations are, are a concern. Um, I think you got probably got to do a little a little more deep diving. And Nick, when you first had that issue, were there modules to assist with like async versus synchronous translation of that of yeah. layout builder? There were, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's AT translations and ST translations yeah. or something. Like that. Yep. Right. So I mean, there there there's there's support there, and you know, I'm actually running into the JSON API issue myself right now, and. Um, you know, we're, we're working through the patches. And I think the biggest thing there is like making sure the project can use patches, right. Is, is willing to use those patches. Cause if you're, if your client or your project is like, Hey, listen, patches aren't, aren't going to fly um, or core patches aren't going to fly. Then like you're pro you're, you're probably switching gears pretty quick there. I I mean, if I, if I were to summarize that point more, it's layout builder basically did things its own way that didn't integrate with all the different core systems that you would expect a core module to do. And it's now in maintenance mode. So the maintainers, while they still provide some fixes and stuff, they're not actively developing it anymore. So all these fixes, just they're just not ever gonna get in because they put in a huge lift to get it where it is. Said there's a lot of really hard problems to solve to get those other integrations. And they're just, they're, my understanding is they're just not gonna get done. And, and that's kind of one of the, that, that's a big concern for me. I mean, things like translations just don't work the way you would expect out of the box. Interacting with it programmatically doesn't work that you would work the way you would expect out of the box. Um, and like I said, I, it, it's not like I've totally, totally sworn it off and said, I will never use Layout Builder. Yeah, there's, there's certainly use cases. Not going to lie. Kind of sounds like that, but. No, no, no. I, I've implemented another project since, but it's, it's, I try to kind of quarantine it. <laughs> keep it self-contained um <laughs> at an arm's distance well. super super interesting yeah. viewpoint there yeah so i think looking at that whole whole thing is there anything else any other reasons why you wouldn't use layout builder because nick told me not to there you go <laughs> that's it that's the takeaway nick yeah, told you, me not you, to use yeah, it i, I think yeah, the, the, the main point is that you should just really consider the use case, do some actual testing with it because- Yeah, yeah. make again, sure you understand what you need to deliver. To yeah, yeah. yeah. Layout and Builder team's going to send Nick nasty emails now. 
Last 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 point on why you wouldn't is something that I haven't run into, but I think would probably be a nightmare is migrations. If you have to migrate out of layout builder or into layout builder, I imagine both of those would be horrific. Um, so let's do this. Let's have the same discussion on paragraphs. Why wouldn't you use paragraphs? I mean, for me, I think the biggest thing, the biggest pain point with paragraphs, but again, it's never been a blocker for me, is the interface. Like mm -hmm. you end up, if you have a moderately complex site with paragraphs, you will there will be some confusion with reordering paragraphs or removing the correct paragraph, especially if they're nested. The interface is very complex. Um, and I think that's the biggest pain point uh, out there yeah, right now. I, I agree. I think, you know, I think layout paragraphs probably goes a long way to solve some of those issues. Um, again, I've never used it, but from the uh, from the screenshots and the demos that I've seen, it it goes a long way to kind of resolve some of that. Um, but it is, it, it takes a lot of time for you to get the admin interface into a place where it feels, it feels good for an admin to go in there and like create composable content. And you also have to ask yourself this question is then what is the alternative? Exactly. Uh, lay um, no, no, when you have references. Yeah, entity references where there's not a ton of supporting modules to make that interface super easy either. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's probably worse than well, what, what do you mean? What's paragraphs. what do you mean? What's the alternative though? Like are if, you saying if, like as a, as a composable tool? What's the alternative? Or are you saying as like a as a as a, a content or data structure tool? Yeah, but both. Oh. Yeah. What is yeah. what That's you know? Entity. Paragraphs was created to solve a specific problem because there was really no easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have like structured content that you want people to be able to build on a page, like what would they do otherwise? Just kind of add you, like you generate the page, like they have to go and like, what is the solution? Like, how do you, how do you create those, those um, more complex data structures in an easy way for people to maintain the content. I mean, I think, you know, if you're not going to use paragraphs and you're not going to use layout builder, then yeah, you're looking at like entity references with like inline entity forms or something exactly, like that. Right. And like, yeah. I mean, we, the power of Drupal is there are a million different ways to kind of like slice the apple. Right. Um, yeah. I think layout builder and paragraphs are two, you know, kind of, easier, you know, community provided solutions that can, that can get you there. You just have to weigh pros and cons and, and, and maybe neither of them as you're, as you're kind of alluding to Stephen, maybe neither of them are right, but. Um, you know, I really think the two things we, we call this, we call this thing versus, I really think those two things are solving two different problems to be honest yeah. with you. Right. That, and I think that's people. That's conclusion are, that I, I, I think that's a conclusion I came to. Yeah. I don't know about that though. Like, I, I mean, I think people have used, uh, people 100%. are using paragraphs as a layout tool. Like that's how it's predominantly being used right now. I think the use case that, that Nick uh, spoke to where people are using it as a uh, field collection replacement is, is still a valid one and, mm -hmm. and a good one. Right. But I think a lot of people are using paragraphs as a layout a layout tool. I mean, no, when I first got started using paragraphs like a lot on every project, it was as a layout tool, working to build those component-based layouts. Right. Um, getting back into why uh, wouldn't I use paragraphs? I think the other thing to think about is like database bloat. And that happens quite a bit um, and is, is can be exponential if you have revisions turned on and you're using translation. Um, I think you're, you're, you are looking at quite a bit of, um, added complexity and added bloat to your database with those two things turned on. Um, I, I mean, I mean, that's a concern, but that, that will happen with revisions and translations of blocks too. Like that, that literally has nothing to do with it, whether you're using paragraphs or layout, because if you're using layout with blocks, then those blocks will have revisions and translations too. Yeah. As well, if you're like using paragraphs. entity references, you still have that same blow. Yeah. yeah, but I think you cut down on that with layout builder because of the the layout 
layer, right? There isn't that nesting of, of blocks, right? So you have that layout layer being provided by layout builder that gives you like one column, two column, three column, like 50 column, whatever it is. And then like you have, uh, granted, you are still translating blocks. You're not wrong. You are still handling block revisions, but also keep in mind that those revisions and those translations with the layout builder aren't stored on the entity, right? So like you get into some certain, you can get into situations where like you're making a call to pull your, pull you like your entity, right? And with revisions and translations, and it's just turning because it's going through each one of those paragraphs. And like it can, I've seen in instances where like database is just like completely bomb out because they're like, this is, this thing's too big. We can't do it. Um, now, could that happen with blocks? Yeah, I, I guess maybe, but probably. Um, yeah. So, in conclusion, <laughs> just go back to flat uh, entities where you're just putting fields on things. Oh, God, please no. No, one other thing I was going to bring up here, and I wonder if this is like a concern to either of you, because um, it's one of the things that I, I kind of put in the why wouldn't you use it? column um it's not in core so like there like there's an unir irrational fear in the back of my head that like if you use paragraphs right that someday the maintainer of paragraphs is going to turn around and go nah i'm not doing this anymore and nobody's going to pick up the mantle and it's it, it could potentially kind of like lose favor and and not not have support right and maybe that's like a totally irrational fear but like there's some, to me, and may, and I'm asking you guys if you agree with this, like there's some safety with like looking at whether it's in core or not as like, hey, this is going to be like a long-term option for a solution. So it's something I consider, but it's funny because there are, there's some modules that I feel they solve such a fundamental problem and have such a widespread adoption that they're near enough core that they don't concern me. And that things like web form paragraphs, um, those don't, I don't have that concern with them because they're a problem that needs to be solved. And even if this went away, something else would fill that gap. Um, and I, it's funny because now that you bring this up, I kind of feel the opposite about Leo Builder. Like I feel like Leo Builder is less supported in the Drupal ecosystem, even though it's in core than paragraphs. Like I'm more comfortable using paragraphs than I am using layout builder. Like I, I won't even question adding paragraphs to a project. I will spend time thinking about whether or not layout builder should be added. So go back to go back to uh, like 20 minutes where I said, why choose lay, uh, paragraphs? And the first item was it's known. Nick, Nick just illustrated that point, right? It's a known, it's a known entity. Uh, Stephen, what about you? Is that is that like a factor or a concern when you're thinking about this stuff? Totally. I totally agree that I always try to lean towards core first and go outside when there's nothing competing. And this paragraphs versus entity reference thing is always something that's on my mind related to this. But Nick said something five minutes ago that I'm still thinking about. And I'm wondering if it's just his opinion or if it's true that layout builder is in maintenance mode and there's no new work going on with it. And if that's the truth, then, I mean, that kind of breaks down that, that, Hey, it's in core. I should trust it more feeling for me. Yeah. I, I think we probably want to verify that with somebody that, that has, has, not saying that Nick doesn't have knowledge, but has like direct yeah. knowledge of that because yeah. I find that, a little hard to believe because layout and it, builder. It gives me the it gives me the feeling the way you described it was. It gave me the feeling like they just throw it up their hands, like, all right, this thing's too hard. We're done with this. Yeah, but I think I, I mean I think layout like composability is a large part of of CMSs and mm. and and how things are going forward with CMSs. So to say that like layout builders and maintenance mode kind of feels like um, it's alarming to me as well. Uh, so I think think that's something that we we will probably want to ask about or or get more more in depth uh, detail about. 
it's been hinted at even with other core modules too. Like um, when we had Adam on and um, Sean, you know, they mentioned kind of the same thing. Once they got media and core, they're still working on it. They're still fixing things, but getting media library up to snuff was a huge effort. And so now they're focused, they're more maintenance mode. And I think that's, and that's true of most thing, initiatives that get in core. Once it gets in core, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief, you fix major issues, but you're not, you know, you don't have that push anymore to do it because it's such a massive effort to get it in. So it's not, that's not to, I, when I say that, I'm not saying that as any sort of slight or detraction against the team that got that in because yeah. I certainly am not capable of doing that. Um, but I bring that up just to say that a lot of these deep seated diversions from the way that Drupal, you kind of expect Drupal to work with these kinds of things, a lot of them probably won't be solved because at least in the, in the short term, unless there's. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't I mean, within the next two or three years, I guess I don't necessarily agree with that hundred percent. Like I think that like there is a patch system in place and a ability to do a merge request to, to get, you know, to fix these features. And I think the issue that we have in the show notes is a, is an example of that. Like it's, it's been open for a while and people are still working on it to try to get it to a place where maybe it can be rolled in. And I think like when, when it is ready, it will be. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's something where, you know, it's definitely going to going to the community and going to, um, more of a patch fix mentality than like a, Hey, a big push to kind of get, get something updated. Um, so Stephen kind of, uh, moving, moving on, bringing the show in for a landing here, uh, Stephen kind of alluded to this earlier, um, but like, is there a scenario where you don't really have to choose? You can kind of use the best of both worlds and, and use, um, you know, use paragraphs and uh, layout builder on a project. I mean, like I said, that project that used layout builder extensively did use paragraphs as well. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't think this is one of those ones I think Steve put it best. They solve different problems in my book. Like, yes, people are using paragraphs to handle layouts, but in general, I think the two projects, they solve different problems. You can use them both. Um, there's, I don't think there's any problem with that. I think, I think you can use them both as long as they stay in their lane, right? If you're using layout builder for layout and you're using paragraphs for structured, better structured data, I think that that's, that's great. I think if you were to start using layout builder and then try to use um, paragraphs for layout, you would quickly, the system would quickly become unmanageable. If you are using paragraphs simply to define structured content, not for layout, can you then use layout builder to display the paragraph data on a page? You. I think you could, but you might have to do some kind of trickery, right? Where you're using possibly like an entity reference, some sort of entity reference field in a block in order to be able to place that paragraph, maybe? Well, I don't or, know. Can, can, you pay, can you place fields directly with Layout Builder? I feel like that is, is a uh, paragraph option. Is an you, could, you, could make, you could add a paragraph as a block. Like you could just make it a block. Right. Not make it a block, but you could expose that entity to um, layout builder somehow. Right. And I'm sure there's probably already a module that does that. Like, I, I, will, I will check after the show, but I'm 100% confident <laughs> that there's a module that does that. So, but that's not a common thing that you had considered or tried to do. No, because no. again, the, the, the problems are... The problem, the issues that I run into layout builder or doesn't matter what entity it's displaying, yeah. it's the fact that it divorces that content from right. the Drupal system essentially. Yeah. So we have a couple of comments here from uh, from Josh. Josh uh, provided us with three three great uh, comments via Twitter. So we we already talked about one of them. Josh Miller uh, says, paragraphs and layout builder pose a huge risk for moving your data in and out of the system. 
Um, are we digging ourselves into a complex web we could ne we could never leave? Um, so I think we kind of already talked about that, and uh, you know I think that you know through the migration API you could probably get find a way out of whatever system you build yourself into, but I think it, it ultimately goes to that bigger conversation of like data model layout, who's handling what and you know what you are using right so you have to have a very clear understanding of the system in order to be able to build a migration that gets you gets you out of it or allows you to migrate away from it would you both agree disagree yeah i agree i mean yeah yeah all right and the last one the last one from josh Another concern is around templating, layout builder and tra uh, and translate to con consists consistent page experiences. We have seven types of publications. Do we create one publication type each or can we have seven templates for one type? I mean, in my experience, it, it's easier to template with paragraphs and with layout builder, um, but... <laughs> But then again, Layout Builder, has, I think Layout Builder has come a fair way with that too. So it might be might be a little bit easier now. But if you're trying to dig into a particular layout section the way that you would expect to, I think that that was one of the areas we were, I ran into issues as well. And with, uh, you know, with things that you just expect to work not working. I think his question is more about how much control should you give somebody to uh freedom should you give them to design a page on a website so here's the here's like a like a fundamental question that's not a tool related question yeah so we talk we talked about this a little bit with composable architecture right and i think that that is the way that marketing teams and mm -hmm. and creative teams out there are going they sure. are building um they are building component libraries that have components and their their content management system is basically a tool for them to lay the lay out these components into pages so yeah. you know i think the the answer there is like again you have to look at the system that you're building if you're building a layout tool a component uh, a page building tool then there are going to be a lot of options and you have to kind of like test for all of those and figure all of those out um, Thank you, Gutenberg, right? Yeah. I mean, right. you look at Layout Builder, Gutenberg, like there are a lot of systems that are allowing for very composable architectures. And if you look at, you know, even, even Acquia has um, Site Studio, which is, uh, is their, you know, composable architecture tool. So like when you look at a uh, page builder, right, that's what people want to be able to do. They want to be able to compose whatever type of page that they want. And I think that's, you know, I think that's the power of a content management system, the power of, um, of Drupal. You know, I think WordPress had that has had that capability for a while, and that's kind of what makes them more popular in the design community. I think Drupal is doing its best to catch up to that. And um, yeah, I think, I think that's the way that the uh, industry is going. We don't have time for this right now, but I'm working on a WordPress project right now with Gutenberg. I have some very strong opinions about that last statement, <laughs> but maybe maybe we'll talk about Gutenberg in a couple of. I, I smell I months. smell our your next update being about that. Well, we've got a this and that or a off the cuff or whatever we're going to call the next episode. That could be one of the things to chat about. And there you go. Could be. Do you have questions or feedback? Reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or via email at show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. If you're interested in show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and Chad's book corner, sign up for our newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. You can promote your Drupal camp on Talking Drupal. You can learn more about this at talkingdrupal.com slash camp promo. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support's greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and choosing the Become a Patron button in the sidebar. So we've reached the end of our show. Stephen, 
thanks for joining us again. We look forward to the next uh, three episodes. And uh, if our listeners wanted to get a hold of you, remind them how to do that. Uh, it's at Stephen Cross on Twitter with a PH. We can go to stephencross.com. Um, a lot more Raspberry Pi stuff there than Drupal stuff there lately, but uh, it's another way to see things that I'm working on. Man, now I want some Raspberry Pi. Nick Laughlin, where can somebody find you? You can find me pretty much everywhere at Nixman, N I C X V A N. And I'm John Picozzi. You can find me on all the major social networks and Drupal.org at John Picozzi. And you can find out about EPAM at EPAM.com. If you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. See you guys next week. Have a good one.